Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to CMS. We are hoping to show you guys the CMS detector today, and we're excited to have you. My name is Andres. And my name is Mahi. So um, we're both uh, part of the CMS collaboration. And um, I would like to show you guys a few details uh, before we really get started. Um, and then we're going to, well, Mahi's going to go underground and show you guys the actual detector. So um, do you, before we start, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Uh, yes. I mean, he's a young physicist. I'm the old physicist. I have been <laughs> here. Oh, I want to say the truth. I have been here since uh, 1989 when I finished my PhD in the US in high energy physics. And uh, I keep uh, enjoying my job ever since. I was looking at the Indico page that your teachers have put together and there are some exceptionally good links, no matter in which part of high energy physics you are interested in. because you know, high energy physics, like most science now, sciences now, there is a very technical part, and there is the part that has to do just with equations and abstract spaces. That's why in our field, we are a wide, very variable community of people working in order to put it all together. So uh, keep in mind that either you are interested in uh, very uh, complicated engineering in computer science, in mathematics, or in physics, it might be a, a good opportunity to learn something. So I leave it to Andres now, who's the young guy here, the new kid in the block. Thanks. So uh, just a quick word about myself. I, I grew up in Puerto Rico. And one of the things that, I, I don't know if you even knew this, but I actually did my undergraduate degree in engineering. And I switched to physics uh, for my PhD. And I think that's a very good point is that there is uh, an immense amount of work going on here at CERN. And a lot of it has to do with engineering, all kinds of engineering. I mean, and we work with engineers all the time. So there's many challenges. If you guys are interested in any aspect of it, I think we really encourage you to look into it. Yes. And uh, it's uh, um, actually CERN is important. It's important to us physicists and people of uh, the same background like us because of the research it does. But it's very important also to the national funding. And uh, CERN is not funded directly by the US, but it is funded also, the experiments are, the detectors are, many large projects are US funded. It is much more important to the funding agencies as a part of uh, engineering or computer science or things that have some that might have some potential applications so there are two two uh, fields that are very much uh, exchanging information and working together the detectors what we are going to show you the accelerator everything is done in such a way because of the physics so that's clear it's the physics that defines what we have to build here but it's also what we have to build is being uh, uh, normalized. It's being uh, uh, revisited by the capacities you have in engineering, in computer science, and you are having development teams that will try to bring uh, materials, components, uh, electronics to such a level that we would be able to use them for what we want to do. And it's exactly this part that interests more the national teams or the national funding, and it's normal. So I encourage you to look in all the links that your teachers have put there because they're very, very interesting. Yep. And just as a very quick practical example of this, uh, here at CERN, there is a lot of drive, a lot of development in particular in material science uh, focused on superconducting technology. So, uh, you, you know, we're constantly pushing the envelope, trying to develop, you know, more powerful magnets, superconducting magnets. And uh, that is, is great for us as physicists, but it also 
means that this technology can, uh, you know, uh, have ripples all throughout society. So that means uh, that also has implications for medical imaging, for example. Um, and that's, you know, there's the very famous example of the World Wide Web, which was developed here at CERN as well. And we can think of many other examples, but I, I think you get the point. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. There are many, many things in materials. Uh, CERN is equivalent to very, very many startups. So it's, uh, there is lots of R&D happening on many things that you wouldn't have thought possible for CERN. So it's not just this abstract space of uh, physicists uh, walking around and uh, uh, mumbling uh, formulas. It's this also, but it's lots of things about practical life, material, engineering, methods, methodology. Uh, it's really an interesting place. So now I think that uh, we should start uh, telling you a little bit about, uh, I think that Andres will tell you a little bit uh, about the accelerator and about the detectors. And I will be coming in if I think that I have something more interesting to tell you. Yes, so you please any time. Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. So, um, so sorry, uh, maybe we can show a couple of the slides and- mm -hmm. just Should we start with this one? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Um, so we have this, uh, hopefully you can see this, this picture here, uh, which is a photo taken from the Jura Mountains. And in the background, you can see the Alps. These aren't, I think they're not clouds at all. It's a, it's a this clear is day. Fine. And these are the Alps in the distance. You can see Mont Blanc. And uh, a bit closer to the foreground, you can see the Geneva Lake. So this is really, uh, you know, you can see Geneva in the distance and you can see sort of the French countryside closer to where the picture was taken. And you can see from the picture, you can uh, see several points marked in this uh, image, but I think first you can, maybe we can highlight the border. So oh, yeah. this entire area is really at the border, the, the Swiss French border. So something that's really cool is that every day, at least when I show up to CERN, I have to cross the border. And uh, when, you, when you are inside of CERN, you might cross the border a few times, just in a regular, uh, you know, the, the CERN campus itself is crossed by the border. Yeah. I'm on the French side. <laughs> um, so the, as you may, might imagine, this yellow line is not actually painted on the surface. Uh, it just corresponds to where the LHC tunnel is uh, is located, but most of the facilities are actually underground. Uh, and maybe we have another yeah, picture that one. we can show. So you, this gives you a sense of uh, if you actually come to CERN, there are a few uh, facilities or, or locations where we have uh, buildings and infrastructure, but a lot of the really cool stuff is underground. So. Um, that's where most of the LHC apparatus is. And at the LHC, we have four main detectors. So we have ATLAS and CMS, which we call sort of general purpose detectors. And then we have ELISE and LHCB, which are more sort of specialized. And the LHC itself, I would, if I were to describe it very, very, very quickly, is uh, I would just say that you have protons going in one direction and then protons going in the other direction. And what you do is they are injected. We'll talk about how that happens. But when they get to the LHC, what you want to do is you want to accelerate them. And we use radio frequency cavities. But that just means that we give them a little electromagnetic push. And every time it, they go around the ring, we just push them with a little bit more energy. And as we do that, we have to uh, use these magnets that are all the way around the ring. There's 1,232 dipole magnets that steer these protons around the ring. And there's many, many other, uh, also what we call quadrupoles that sort of keep the shape of the beam. Uh, and we have to do that balance. We have to add more energy to them and then increase the current in those magnets so they steer and stay inside of the tunnel. Anything? Yeah. What well, you are going to be listening to? So you think of LHC. When we say LHC, first is the building, which is this huge underground donut. It's buried underground, and it has 
eight big bubbles on it. And in four of the big bubbles, you have detectors. You can think of detectors as cameras that are taking pictures at very high speed with uh, particular selection rules, but it's they're taking pictures of events that happen really some seconds after the initial Big Bang. So this is their all, but think if you think of LHC, LHC is the biggest machine, the largest machine we have on Earth now. It's this huge underground tunnel, donut, around 60 and 120 meters, depending on where you try to put it under the mountains, because it's not the easiest landscape here. And inside there, you have two uh, continuous circles of bunches of protons going around, which are kept in orbit by the, 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 the famous superconductive magnets that Andres told you. And if you are going to have any questions to ask, because I understand that you are three schools and you might just write them aside, send them to us or uh, start so asking also so that can, we can, can, we yes. can discuss. Yeah. You can, you fact, can yes. just write. You, you can just uh, go ahead and yes. ask questions at any time. Yeah. Okay. Don't so, hesitate. Huh? So something that we could discuss really quickly. Uh, so I imagine that some people might think that we just collide one proton and then another proton. That would be but very simple. <laughs> if we could do that, that would be great. But yeah. we, you know, what we have to do is we take many, many protons. There's a bunch of maybe a, a couple hundred billion protons, and then they come together with, uh, you know, a couple hundred billion protons and they we squeeze them to about the width of a human hair and then from that interaction of course they're traveling essentially at the speed of light and from that interaction we try to investigate recreate what happens and these are you know we build these giant cameras as Mahi called them and we want to know we want to we basically play detectives we basically want to know exactly what happened, but things happen so quickly that we're really always looking at the aftermath of these interactions. And we then can compare them to what our equations, our prediction, or our model or simulation tell us that should happen. And that's the game, is you're always comparing what do we expect versus what do we actually get. And if things are unexpected, that, that's where it gets really interesting. So I hope that you you under, you have an idea of what we are doing or how we are doing things. Of course, CERN is the place where the lab of CERN is made for building the accelerators, and maintaining them, keeping them in order, etc. The detectors, on the other hand, which are gigantic, are the product of collaboration with the international collaborations with very many institutes very many developers, uh, very many schools of thinking, and, but in principle, uh, they all have, when you are discussing detectors in LHC, uh, some main points, which are, one, the inside the detector, in the center of the detector, you have these collisions that Andres was telling you about, which are a little bit statistical because you have a, whole, a big ball with billions of protons and another one with billions of protons and they are together in space so some of them will bang on some others usually you have something like 50 or 60 and these uh, 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 products of this smashing of protons first go through the part of the detector that we call tracker so the tracker part of the detector so you have the beam it's inside something that is called the beam pipe. And uh, inside the detector, the protons are left to, to interact. The first uh, thing that sees them is the tracker. The tracker's role is to give you the points of the charged particles that are produced. You imagine it as a series of concentric cylinders on every cylinder surface a charged particle will leave a signature. So by joining the lines, if you have seven or eight or nine concentric cylinders, 
you can see the trajectory of the particle that produced it. Can I very quickly? Now, yes. So uh, one way to see this actually is the technology that the kind of sensors that we use are similar to camera sensors. So you can imagine if we take uh, a bunch of custom-made camera sensors and we uh, make them into, into these concentric cylinders, this is sort of what our detector looks like. Of course, it's quite a bit more complicated than that, but uh, something that's also very different from a regular camera sensor is, and I already Maki mentioned that, uh, you know, it's sort of like taking photographs and this is kind of a close analogy, but we have to do that very, 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 very often. Uh, so do you want to give them an idea of how often that is? The 25 nanocycles is the magic number in... So actually the sure. camera is yes. only 80 megapixels. As yes, far as I exactly. know the, so it so is not, not a big not, deal. It's uh, not a big deal, but, <laughs> but it's pretty big, darn fast, very fast, and able to function in a very strong magnetic field that we are going to say, and take some part of radiation because it's in a radioactive oh, yeah. environment. And also so, dies in. Exactly. <laughs> so, so it's not very, very simple, this camera. It is... Uh, so this is called the tracker. It's the first part. So you take pictures of how the charged particles are distributed in space for every single collision. You have some tens of collisions every 25 nanoseconds. Most of what comes out of this is crap. So you want to throw it away and you have not to, not to put it in any format, in any picture. So you have a logic field that allows you to do that. And whatever is interesting, you keep it. However, after you go out of the, of the camera that gives you the tracks, you go in a part of the detector that's called calorimeter. And the role of the calorimeter is to measure the energy of the particles that go inside. You know exactly where a particle, a charged particle enters in the calorimeter because you have the tracker. But the role of the calorimeter is the inverse. The role of the calorimeter, the role of the tracker is just to see the track do not interact at all, if possible, with the particle. The calorimeter, on contrary, wants to measure the energy. So you kill the particles inside the calorimeters. It using, yeah. Yes, show yeah. us. Yes, exactly. You see in the green part where it says electromagnetic calorimeter and the yellow part that says hadron calorimeter, lots of distraction happening because you force the particle to go through a material and interact with this material. This is usually heavy or in a sense, heavy material. And the particle starts interacting. All interactions, most interactions we have are producing uh, photons or charged particles or electrons as a signature. So I will not get in the details, but you produce lots of uh, particles, which of course have less energy than the initial particle. And these that look like this little uh, black blimps that you see there, it's, we call it shower because it's really lots and lots and lots of particles going away. If you can measure the energy of each one of these particles produced, then you know the energy of the particle that uh, came in and produced it. It sounds very complicated. It is very complicated, but it is a technology that in high energy physics we have mastered now and we are using it uh, since ever. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's actually far, far much, much more complicated than we're making it seem. There's many, many details here, but I just wanted to give you sort of an overall picture about what you're looking at right now. So it might not be obvious. I mean, if you compare it to the previous image, this is sort of a slice. Like if you just took the center of the detector and you took a very thin slice of the barrel of the cylinder and you looked at the particles coming in, so um, you would first see the tracker, as Maki said, and then the calorimeter. So if we look at that uh, image again of the cross section, we I, what I would say is that when when we're in the tracker, we want the particles to not interact. We want we want them to be unaffected by the material by our detectors, and then they reach the calorimeter, and we want to absorb them to destroy them almost and figure out what their energy is. And at, after that, we have this superconducting solenoid. So well, I, I think we need to describe the magnet yeah. we haven't talked about. But after this magnet, almost no particles escape. 
So there's one very important particle that does escape, which is the muon. And the muon is like a, like a heavy electron. And in order for us to measure the muons, we want to really uh, have this magnetic field. So we want to have a strong magnetic field uh, and in the, like, let's say, the outer regions of our detector. And in order to have that, we need a lot of steel. Uh, by a lot of steel, I mean about 12,500 tons of steel. So the total weight of the detector is about 14,000 tons. Of those 14,000 tons, 12,500 belong to the muon system. So, uh, Maki, do you want to say a word about the magnet? Yes. So now. Can, can the text ask story. a question? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, we had a, some announcements going on, and I don't know whether you were this was being said over the announcements. So the particles where you're trying to sort of figure out based on the energies produced, are those ones you would classify as your virtual particles? And could you explain that a little bit more? And I'm sorry if you went over that. We had announcements going on. No, no, these are not. I mean, they're, they're pretty real particles that are being produced during the interaction. What you have sometimes is you have particles that you cannot see because uh, in a tracker, you can see only particles that have charges, that have charge. But there are very many particles that have no charge, OK? So there, I, we have not been discussing the, the neutrons and the very elusive neutrinos. All this, yeah, that's about, yes, yes. All, all this you are going to have to deduce by the fact that you add up correctly all the energy and the momenta, and then you find something that you are missing from your initial inputs, which are two protons colliding of, at a certain energy. Yeah. But okay. I think the question yes. was rather was regarding the, the, the virtual no, no, no. particles. No, the virtual the, particles this, usually the particles that uh, that are exchanged between when, yes. between yes. two particles when when uh, 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 an interaction happens. These particles cannot be viewed. These particles are are the the force carriers in this sense. They yes. uh, if you look at just the creation of this particle, neither the energy or the momentum conservation uh, is is kept. Uh, it should be emitted and absorbed in order to have the. So I, I think one way to see can, this. Can I just inter interrupt you for a moment? I'm sorry. But the Wheeler group is going to have to leave in a little bit more than half an hour. I was wondering whether you could maybe start to go downstairs exactly. as well. So they Me, I'm ready to go downstairs. I, think, I, think I will go downstairs at any minute to, you want. Yeah, exactly. I that, can go that was, that was a I'm good told comment. I get, Thank provided you very much. I get clearance, I'm ready to go. Okay. Speed up a little bit. Yeah. So they let me go. I go and you continue with the. Okay. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so get... very quickly going back to this point. Um, so I would say a virtual particle by definition is not a observable, right? Mm -hmm. So if, it, if you can observe it, it's no longer a virtual particle. So in our detector, we have a certain set of uh, particles that we can detect. And uh, we've sort of alluded to this, any charged particle we should be able to observe in the tracker. Um, and uh, photons uh, do kind of special things as well. But um, then in the calorimeters, we can observe photons and electrons. The hadronic calorimeter allows us to uh, measure hadronic activity. So that means quarks and gluons, uh, roughly speaking. And then after that, as I mentioned, we really mostly just detect nuance. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the overall picture. Uh, I was about to, I think we were about to talk about, uh, about the magnet. So let me say just a very quick description. So in CMS, we have this, uh, one of the main components of our detector is the, the superconducting solenoid. And this is a single unit of cylinder. It's about six meters in inner diameter. And it's uh, the main component that makes it superconducting is now you titanium. And in order for this to work, you need to cool it down to about four Kelvin. And then you need to inject about 18,000 amperes of current. So it's kind of, it's very extreme, um, but it certainly works really well. So it generates 3.8 Tesla, 
which is, I think, about 200,000 times the Earth's magnetic mm -hmm. field. Um, and it's a very remarkable and sort of central to the design of CMS. Uh, one way we can sort of describe our detector, it's compared to Atlas, for example, our detector is compact. And that is, it, it can be compact because it, uh, we have such a strong magnetic field, right? So that means that we can bend the particles faster in a small amount of length. Uh, compared to Atlas. In Atlas, a particle, you have to let it fly in order for it to acquire enough curvature. And the idea here with the magnetic field is that um, a charged particle under a magnetic field will bend. And of course, the amount that it bends is proportional to its energy or its momentum. So if a particle just goes pretty much straight, uh, it's either neutral or it has a very, very large momentum. And a particle that's a charged particle that's traveling slowly will just kind of spiral in on itself. So you can see that our colleagues are now getting on the elevator. And uh, typically at this point, uh, I mentioned that we're probably going to lose them for a minute, but they should come back once they're downstairs. So we've already described that at DLHC, we have most of the facilities. Uh, around 100 meters underground. Some are even deeper, like 150 meters. Some even closer to the surface is uh, something like 50 meters sometimes. Um, but the main reasons, or at least one of the good reasons why everything has to be underground is that I already mentioned, CMS is very, very heavy. It's 14,000 tons. Uh, we usually say, I don't know if, how good a comparison it is, but it's twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. So it's a lot, it's a very heavy detector. And if we just built it on the surface in this region where we are, it would just sink because the soil here is very soft. Um, so it, we basically have to put these detectors on, on top of the bedrock, which happens to be really deep underground. Um, so, okay, our, our colleagues are now about 90 meters underground. Um, I'm going to let you guys, Maki, if there's anything you want to uh, point out or, or talk about, please go ahead. I'm not sure we can hear them. So they are muted. Yeah. For some reason. All right. So we are at 80 meters underground. They did, they did something. And we start because the detector is in one bubble, but you have to think of a second bubble next to it that allows us to put all the complicated and very crucial electronics that allow us to power the detector, to monitor it at any point, to have, a, to have a, a information about the environmental parameters, and to be able to say, start taking data now, because we are having collisions and everything is fine, and stop taking data and restart, etc. So it's like you have a uh, you are using any machine, you have a control panel. So here we have very many, very complex control panels. And uh, you just, you can just get an idea. You can just get an idea of each one of them. That's what we were saying that if you are thinking that uh, here we only have physics done, you are very wrong. It's a lot of engineering, a lot of, uh, uh, powering a lot of communications, a lot of r and in uh, computing science, in modeling, uh, in whatever you want to think about. You can see very many fibers. Usually power is uh, thick cables and beautiful colored little strings are the fibers that carry the data. Eh? Whatever is data is fibers. So uh, maybe so, I can lots add and just lots a few. of electronics. Yeah. So Maki, maybe I can add. So Maki is one of our now experts we are, we in have CMS. Two such large rooms, so one head. here and one a level higher, and uh, we are walking towards the part of the cave where you have the detector. In all these, you see, they are accompanied by protection systems because many of them are unique pieces of electronics. So if we have a, 
an electrical fire or something, it's very simple to happen. We destroy things that we cannot buy uh, just by just using money. You might have as much money as you like, which you usually don't because you are doing research, but you have to have the time to redevelop all these pieces that are quite unique many times. So now I'm walking, we are walking with Noemi towards the detector. Um, we, we are passing. We can see we have many, many control systems. You can see a glimpse here. For example, we have gas systems, most of which here they have as a role to give a, a dry atmosphere and the control atmosphere inside the detector. So for you, for the ones of you that want to do chemical engineering or want to be chemists, there is always a place. It's, it's never simple. Of course, we have several real safety systems for knowing whether there is a fire uh, and the systems that allow you to monitor radiation and radioactivity. However, you have to know because CERN is an open lab, everybody can practically go everywhere. You have a zero radiation policy. So it's not like a, a, a facility where the some radiation exposure is allowed. At CERN, this is never the case. So here, what you see this, uh, this red door, if opened, allows you to walk for a while and get inside the accelerator tunnel, which is not a good thing at all. That's why the door is locked and can only be opened by breaking a special, special interlock here. So you see. So uh, if you break that, uh, you better have a good reason to do it because that will bring all the power of the accelerator down and it would be very difficult to restart it. But still, it's a place where you can you can go. So here you have a corridor that you see, uh, usually most people that uh, have on their Facebook or whatever social media page, a picture with the magnets of LHC, they take it here because in fact, it's very difficult to, to gain access to the LHC tunnel exactly due to radiation. So whoever you know that takes a picture like this, it's, it's a fake, but it's a very nice fake. Okay, so we have all the all. If you were here to visit, you would see all these explanations about the how do the uh, magnets work and what are the magnets. It's a big thing, the magnets at CERN. And now we are, I'm opening the entrance that will allow me to go in the detector area. This is yet another control level. So So, Matthew, do you want to say anything about the access? Maybe the retina scan. Yeah, I'm just telling them the access about it. Okay. Just it's it, I just got kicked out by the access. I'll try again. So now I am going to be having the famous iris scan. The lady liked me, so I have access. And I'll wait for Noemi, and we are going to go in the detector area for you. Actually, you will be able to see some parts of the detector that you cannot visit if you come as a visitor, because we will first start from the visitor platform, which is where all visitors go but then we will be able to go around the detector to move around. So please follow us. And now we are in the detector area. So you see, it is this uh, huge cylinder that weighs more than 14,000 tons. It is more than 20 something meters long and more than 12 meters high. And it's, uh, it has a very, very 
self-defined structure. Now what you see is the first part of the wheel. So we always say the detector is a barrel. So it's a barrel here and it has two end cups, okay? And they are all part of the detection procedure. So now you see one end cup is removed. You can see the beam pipe or rather you can see the pipe that contains the beam pipe because the beam pipe is a very important and special thing, you see it. Huh? It will go all the way up to the beginning of the tracker inside. And what you see here, the copper uh, parts are parts of what uh, Alex was saying for the muon chambers. Indeed, you see ME. Muon end cup. M E stands for muon end cup. So, so these are uh, chambers. You can see that the detector is being kept. Uh, I'll go there. So maybe you can say something about the slices, and I think people can kind of see what one of the CMS slices. So the like. detector is being uh, kept by these supports, uh, which are eventually you see the two metallic handles that are keeping it just to make sure. And it is being moved the, the several slices because the, the, the big cylinder can be, is cut in slices just like a cake. Uh, is being moved by using these uh, uh, air pads, these big orange things that allow us to lift it up, to lift the parts which many times uh, weigh some uh, 3000 tons. To, they are lifted a little bit and then they are easier to move. And of course, you are seeing a very, you are having a very vague idea of the cables, uh, the pipes, because parts of the detector are kept at specific temperatures. So you have uh, cooling systems that are involved. The whole system has to be made dry. So you have gas systems and you have certain parts of electronics that cannot be far away from the detector. So they have to be close to the cavern, which is the thing means that they are having to be able to take, to resist a certain amount of radiation, uh, excuse me, a certain amount of uh, uh, magnetic field because you have the magnetic field plus uh, some radiation. So all this is a lot of work on material science and here, what Noemi is showing you is showing you. Uh, a UCL electronics, because many times the universities, these are all these are all elaborate electronics developed, and many times they are signed because they are sort of unique. And this this is you can see that the cable stuck here or ends here, and they go really inside the detector. So these are the cables that write data or give power or do whatever for. So the detector is here. You can practically see it, touch it, touch it out. It's very outside. And uh, uh, in the, it has, it's just the outer crust of the detector that you can see in those gaps. Huh? And uh, Yes, you can see the detector parts. And then you can move inside. What you can see is the very outside, which is the muon. If you could get inside, then you would meet the calorimeter, and then you would meet the tracker. And then you would uh, meet the protons that are inside. Right now, of course, there is not any proton in the area, and the detector, as you saw, and you see here also, is open. So the two end points of the detector, the two end caps are open. When uh, everything is finished, this part will move and will come and touch the other part. The same will happen on the other side and the detector will be closed and ready to function. Again, the same, you see the beam pipe, you see some parts of the mules, um, you see, all the funny cherry pickers that we use in order to have access everywhere. And you see all the infrastructure that's necessary 
in order for us to be able to make this device work, do what it is supposed to do. So now we are going to move down. So go close to the detector peak, so to say. So you see another view. And you see the beam pipe again. And uh, uh, what you have to remember is that we are using also this part of the, uh, of the structure, the orange part that you see is part of the support of the beam pipe because for two reasons, for of the structure, so for two reasons. One reason is that uh, this area, the end caps areas, are the areas that you get when you imagine you have a collision between two cars going at very high speeds. It goes like that. So the most energetic bits and pieces will go in the forward areas. You see, it's like, like that. If you break something like that, the parts of it that have most of the energy will go forward and backward. So it's here that you have most radiation. You always want to have some more shielding. So this uh, orange uh, cement thing will produce, will, will give you some more shielding. Plus it uh, supports the beam pipe that Noemi is showing you there. It supports it because we are underground and we are in an area that has mountains, does not have huge earthquakes, at least we hope, but you have micro movements. So you have to keep the beam pipe as stable as possible because here we are trying to measure microns so if you have a movement of a micron or some microns you have lost your your case so here you see the end of the detector with the with the beam pipe entering inside okay and that is that side one we have seen side two now we continue to, to descend with Noemi. And now we are at the level of the feet of the detector. There is another level underneath here where you have lots of cables, lots of pipes, but we are not going to discuss it. And here you can see it's lots of uh, stuff for being able to move the several parts of the wheels to use uh, lots of human power and, uh, and an iron rope. Ah, yes. And Noemi is uh, showing me we have a big uh, science experiment here. Where do we put it? You, uh, where do we put it? Uh, where do we put it here? So you see here, you see that the materials are magnetized. Huh? You can, I go away. It is less magnetized. I come close and it's permanent, ma permanently magnetized. Okay, and we, yeah. Just to show you that the magnetic field being a hundred thousand times the Earth's magnetic field leaves its little signature all around. Okay. That's why all the tools that you have to work to work with when you are working inside the detector have to be non-magnetic because if you have a screwdriver that you forget, when the magnet switches on, this becomes a, a lethal weapon. So as we said, this is going to close after a while. The same will happen on the other side and the detector will be complete. And what you are looking is powering and data uh, lines and cables, plus uh, pumps, whatever you have lots of. Each part is a, an interesting piece of engineering.
So, Mafi, maybe we can of take a minute. Of course, we also have lasers. We have everything. I mean, it's a lot of... So I was wondering of, if uh, there were questions. Ah, ah there uh, is. Okay, they're talking. So. so we walk a little bit. So if you guys have any questions, do you, you could go ahead. Hi, this is so, uh, my crush's class. I think we're because they're kind of wondering what would happen if someone were down there while the um, the beam was running. Well, uh, that would be extremely difficult. In fact, I would say it's next to impossible for someone to be in the cavern while we'll put the beam on. Uh, that said, it would not be good. Uh, it's yeah, Sultan. So actually, you wanna... it depends where you are. It depends on where you so, are. Yeah. So if if you would be in the cavern, you would get much less radiation than, let's say, at the final focus magnets. That's probably lethal. While in the cavern, you would survive. But even even in the cavern, the radiation limit, radiation level, is much much beyond the legal limit. So if we would make such an experiment, I think the CERN would be closed the next day. Uh, we try to refrain from Hector, Let us know. Yeah. <laughs> now you are seeing the, the end part. No, no, we are showing you the end part again as it is open. And if you look, um, I don't know if Noemi can show you on top of us, you can see the yellow crane. On top of the yellow crane, you can see an opening. This means that this is the, the this is the shaft that allows us to to uh, lower detector parts inside the cavern with a huge crane. So it, this is the white walls that you see on top of us is the surface, and all the detector has been lowered da down in pieces from there. It has been tested up at the surface and lowered down here. Tested. And if we need a heavy detector piece, this is the way to to bring it in. Can you show us? Now, not anymore. Can you show us the wheel and cables for sliding the slices apart? And then also, can you tell us, please, uh, what the current upgrades are that they're I making? I can't hear you. Uh, Maki, yes, can you, you hear oh, me? Okay. Now I can hear you. Yes. Okay. So, so they are interested in the uh, in the mechanism to to move the slices uh, so this oh we are too yes so the mechanism is as we said the air pods to lift it this is a standard this is a standard industrial procedure it's not that industry doesn't do that and then pulling everything with lots of piercing crying and praying using <laughs> this. And when you are closing the detector, exactly because I said that you have, that you have, we are fighting like uh, crazy for microns. Of course, if you close this system and it starts moving, uh, this is thousands of tons. You cannot say, oh, please a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left. You have sensors that are telling you at what distance you are, if you are making contact or you are not making contact. So it's a, it's a lengthy procedure and it takes uh, a, a lot of science, but also a bit of know-how, experience, etc. But this is the way, lift it by using air pads and then having diminished the uh, the weight of what you are moving, move it gently and continuously while you are controlling the motion by a series of particular sensors of every kind and type, whose of course measurements you have to depict at any point. Actually, the lady that's next to me is doing one of her jobs is doing exactly this, and it's a very it's a very hard job to do. So oh, can I uh, just it. interrupt and uh, there's part of yeah. the question is about mm -hmm. the upgrades. Um, so very quickly, I can just try to answer that. So uh, at this point, we are in a period of maintenance and upgrades that that's been nearly three years. 
of a shutdown and we I'll just uh -huh. list a few of the upgrades that we've been working on. So we uh, Maki has specifically pointed out the beam pipe and that's a brand new component that will allow uh, a bigger tracker detector uh, or pixel detector to be installed in the future. And uh, we also have a brand new or part of a, a new muon system that we call the GEMS. And these are gas electron multipliers. So that makes four muon systems that we have in CMS. We have also just installed, this is part of the work that I do. So we have uh, installed uh, two luminosity detectors that were just rebuilt. We reinstalled the pixel detector and it has a new layer. There has been upgrades to the hydronic calorimeter electronics. And um, that's almost there. I'm sure I'm forgetting many, many other things, but these are what I would call the main upgrade projects. Yeah. Yeah, the main, also some of the upgrades were done so that the future dramatic upgrades that will take place in three, four years from now will be already uh, uh, coming together. So in order to have an inner pixel layer, we had to change the very inside part of the beam pipe. Pixel is the inner part, the innermost part of the tracker. So we were discussing the tracker. The innermost part of it is called pixel. So in, since the pixel managed to, pro, to have pixels even closer to the interaction point, the beam pipe was changed in order to be smaller because we came closer to the beam. But, so, but just to know, because the beam pipe changed because it was smaller, the material of the beam pipe had also to change and become stainless steel because what we had before was a much softer metal and you could not have such a small beam pipe. To cut a long story short, we made the beam pipe much smaller, but the material it was different. So we now have to warm up the, the end parts of the beam pipe in order not to have water dripping out of it when we are in the beam pipe is inside the very cold tracker. So you have a lot of problems, one interleaved to the other, because in order for you to get a picture that gives you a complete physics event, you have to have the synergy of all these systems. This is the important thing to keep in mind. I saw that a question about the paint. So uh, there is a, everything, everything that is here in here has to be minimally radiation resistive, if not radiation hard. Radiation hard is a denomination that is very difficult to get. But you can see, don't ask me about the paint because the paint eventually might hit or whatever. But most important, you see cables. You see fibers, you see pipes, you see valves. There are all these pieces are tested in the radiation that they will receive and in the magnetic field that they will have to, uh, to take while being uh, in, uh, in action here. Indeed, for example, at CERN, uh, there are very many in Europe, just like the US, vendors of cables. You can find very many types of cables that you buy. And, but at CERN, we have to buy always from certain types, from certain vendors. Why? Because our cables have to be radiation resistive and our cables, of course, have to be fire retardant, have to be able to resist uh, uh, burning. So it's material here is a, a very big science. And at CERN, the science of materials, because it's, uh, it's uh, synonymous to detection, has been a big, big, big player. So Maki, really quickly, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, some of you guys might have noticed that we are joined by Sonia. And ah, I just wanted to give you guys a chance. If you have more questions, maybe perhaps Sonia can, uh, can help us answer them. Yeah, OK, good. Day. I can go up, I think, now. We do have a couple of questions in the classroom. So if we can, I'm just going to have the students come up and ask them, okay? 
Sounds yes. good. All right, go ahead. Um, what would happen if like the connector thing got damaged and like broke off while the accelerator was running? So I could I couldn't hear that was pretty yeah. faint, but I think something about a connector failing during collisions. Yeah, we're gonna have it just come right up and ask it. Okay. Um, what would happen if um while the accelerator was running, uh the connector thing like broke off? Um I'm not entirely sure what, what you mean by the connector thing. Um <laughs> but but I think, I mean, generally speaking, we have many things that fail uh, while the accelerator is running. So there's, you know, our detectors, we of course build them to last. And as Maki said, they're tested thoroughly to make sure they'll withstand the, uh, the conditions that they'll be uh, under. However, there are many, the, the systems have, you know, some details always fail. So uh, we we try to minimize this sort of thing and sometimes we're able to repair it, but some parts of the detector are really difficult to access or impossible to access for long periods of time. So depending on what kind of system you're talking about or what kind of connector, sometimes things stop working and sometimes we can fix them. Sometimes it's a bit more complicated and we have to wait for a while until we have access to them. I can, I can add that, that some, what we do, if we can, of course, we can uh, base on redundancy in the sense that sometimes uh, if we judge that it would be a system uh, which is not accessible, we try to, to measure or to get the same, uh, the same information using another system. In such a way, we can, uh, we can uh, how to say, wait for the best period when the, the detector can be opened there is no beam and uh, we can uh, interact. And uh, this is basically something we are using, uh, I would say uh, in all the systems uh, we have uh, at CERN, for example, and also in uh, other uh, detectors that are not a CERN based, but for example, all the satellites, imagine satellites or detectors in space, you cannot, uh, uh, repair immediately the things. So sometimes you cannot repair at all, so you need to have redundancy. This is one way to be safe. So Sonia has a unique perspective because she's part of a collaboration <laughs> called AMS, and that stands for the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And this is actually an instrument that is similar to the detector that you just saw, but of course much smaller because it it goes in the International Space Station. So that's one, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of super jealous that she gets to work on a detector that's in space. Uh, but, but imagine the repairs. I mean, you would need astronauts and this actually happened recently. Uh, yeah. There was a repair that was required and there's a very cool uh, documentary on Disney Plus that you can check out called Among the Stars. I don't know if it's Disney Plus, but I know for sure that NASA and the International uh, European Space Agency, they are, uh, providing uh, all the extravehicular activity because uh, this is uh, quite unique. Uh, not all because there was also some, uh, there was some intervention on the Hubble uh, uh, telescope a few years ago, but uh, okay, they spend but a lot of- This is just at the courtyard. So they, yeah. just, they just take <laughs> up the suit, go out, do the job, go back. But uh, <laughs> as, as I was saying, uh, okay, what I, uh, of course, uh, um, you talk with uh, with us not sometimes, but for example, uh, they were explaining that uh, it's very hard uh, even to get a screwdriver in space because they have these uh, suits with uh, with some uh, pressure inside because of the system, the inner system they have to, or the cooling and the, let's say to keep the temperature at the same level. And uh, each time they they just press, they do this movement, they are fighting. So imagine that you have to spend six hour in a row to do all the connection, etc. So this is very special. In particular for AMS, this was not planned uh, since the beginning. It was a detector which was supposed to stay there and uh, to stay until the end, but then something happened and uh, we had to, to replace some pumps and um, thanks to this activity. But uh, I would like to remind that this is in any case uh, a, a particle physics detector. So 
very is comparable to not in size, not in weight, uh, because in space you cannot bring anything which is 14,000 tons. Uh, 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 as a, a 14,000 uh, weight uh, tons weight. Even but, if we would like to. Yes, no, we AMS is, cheap, only, is only 7.5 tons, and it was what? already a fight. Exactly, this is, this is also a very heavy weight. Yeah, it's a very heavy weight. In fact, when uh, there was this incident uh, or accident, I, would, uh, I should call this in 2003, mm -hmm. when uh, the, the shuttle coming back uh, uh, exploded, Columbia. yes, yeah. exactly, um there was a problem for the missions and uh, we were trying to find another way to go on the space station for example we asked the, the russians yes exactly the elevator <laughs> we asked the russians and uh, unfortunately the weight of ms was too much for any other rocket even for the energia yes everything so in fact there was a, a, we were waiting uh, how to say we were uh, starting to talk with the chinese they they wanted to build a new rocket but in the meanwhile we were approved uh, for a special flight on the on the on the shuttle yeah, and they, because the shuttle was the only one who think about the, that they got uh, after the shuttle program was uh, cancelled, they got an extra flight just for AMS. Yes, yes. That's okay, it really was cool. the, the US Congress who voted for yeah. the import, the scientific importance. So there was a really uh, a, a discussion in the US Congress, and they provided an extra flight for us. Yeah. Even if you cannot see in the, let's say, in the, in the labels of the flight, the flight 134 was added just for AMS. Yeah. So research. actually, in order to arrange this, you don't need to be a, only a very good physicist, yeah. but also a Nobel, Nobel Prize, Prize yeah. helps. Yes, yes. So something, <laughs> something is anyway a, a very good organizer and a very good. So yes, we, but Ting admitted that yeah. he said, OK, and uh, that it was it, he had to do, not the physics. I don't know if you can read it, but he did something else. What he exactly. said. He, he went up to the, uh, so maybe we can to the president of the US. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, but so, if I can say only one thing, uh, just to add it, if, to close this, uh, because uh, if you talk about this, uh, I cannot avoid no, yeah, of course. <laughs> Is that uh, okay? In any case, uh, uh, how to say physics uh, at a certain level needs also this kind of people, and yep. the spokesperson has also to do this uh, so to protect the experiment because an experiment is not only an object they take in data, it's the work of many people, and so it's uh, this something was more. especially not an easy game. So, no, 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 it was really hard. Yeah, again, there's yeah. a really cool documentary you can check out with a lot of details like this uh, it's very fascinating sorry so we have one more question yeah. i'm hoping you guys still have a couple of minutes and maki i don't know if you'd like yeah. to help us answer this question it's about well there's right now i see two of them but it's about the upgrades and um it, it's asking like what will the new upgrades allow us to see and it's you know there's many upgrades and we're pre we're preparing now for what we call run three of the lhc uh, now, this will be, of course, very exciting to get data again, but it will be in, let's say, similar conditions as we had during the previous run. Uh, but maybe we can also talk about the... High but we run. want to see more. We want to see more, we yes. We want to see the same. We, we, we can see the so same. So actually, most of, the, most, of the, most of the physics uh, uh, processes that we are interested in are extremely rare. So, for example, what concerns the Higgs production at this energy where the LHC works, uh, I, as far as I heard, for every 3,000 billions of proton collisions, you get one Higgs. So since we are, since we are uh, studying the, the particle, the world of particles based on the, the statistical mathematics, we need more and as much, as many data as we can. The, the, the luminosity upgrade will make this statistics bigger and actually what we what we want to see if there is any tiny difference between the measurement and the physics predicted if if this happens and we see a difference between the standard model physics predictions and what we see then we know that we we open a new book 
new new chapter. And this is actually what we are looking for. Uh, to, to see a new physics, it's not only cranking up the energy. It might happen if you crank up the, the luminosity. Yeah, so this is just to sort of add to that, the high luminosity uh, LHC program is sort of the next step. It's you know planned for a number of years in the future, but a lot of the preparation that we've talked about, a lot of the research and development for future detectors is happening now and in preparation for that. And there's many, many upgrades for CMS, but that also involves upgrades for the LHC itself. Uh, but again, it's, it's all about uh, getting more data, right? So that means we are increasing the rate of collisions by a factor of almost 10. And that means, as Sultan was saying, that if we're interested in rare processes, this will allow us to see more of those rare processes and see if they behave uh, the way we expect or if they don't. Very interesting. We are okay. Uh not suffering because of course we discovered that with a, a machine an hadronic machine using protons we discovered that the, the higgs boson but uh, we, we if we could have uh, a leptonic machine we could for, uh, just produce only higgs and not uh, as uh, the statistics uh Zoltan was saying uh, just one higgs every that's billions. also yeah that's also that's also uh, an aim uh, a dream the problem at the circular machine is the uh, uh, is the the uh, yes, yes. Exactly. so and and this is scaled up with the the fourth power of the mass one over <laughs> you just build a, a wider accelerator yes actually yes, there, there are some discussions <laughs> about the so, as FCC. you can see <laughs> this, this, this kind of discussion 100 billion dollars yeah, at this point this is so. this is a uh, you know, a topic with a uh, lot of we discussion. We are trying uh, to convince people to support the next no, project. Also, this is basically see, at some point. You see, you have if to... in doing this, oh, you bring uh, uh, such developments that could pay for the expense, you can persuade people, and it's reasonable also. Eh? You will reasonably persuade people that 50% of the cost, for example, is going to be covered by the progress you will do in the magnets mm -hmm. and in the magnetic material. So when you start putting such things on the table, then people will want to, to discuss with you. Yes. That's why you have to do research to do it. You start in your small lab. It's not a small lab, but it's something small. You you do your first your research, you do your calculations, and then you start discussing. Exactly. You have to put something on the table, except the idea that we are going to get the Higgs factor, which is going to be great for, for physics, but we are going to be a yeah. Higgs factor that's great for physics, that's great for engineering, that's great for materials. And of course we are scientists, so you have to have proof of that. And also what I always want to, to, to say here into the level of being boring is that's great for international collaboration because that's all what CERN is about. If we count the nationalities in this room, mm -hmm. you will find uh, several. Uh, if- uh, all different, actually. Yes. In yes. this part of the room, we are all different. Well, yeah. except me and Noemi. Yes, you and Noemi <laughs> are from the same, but the rest of us are from different parts of the world and we, have, we cannot think of a day that we do not work together. So it's also about international collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I really think that you guys would love experiencing that because that's what uh, young people love specifically at CERN. Yeah. So, but we are right in saying that the technology transfer and the impact yes. and that this uh, could start first from us. We shouldn't uh, simply say that, okay, it's uh, fun uh, to find the X, uh, to study the X. This is for us. But not all people, and in particular people who are giving us money, uh, they maybe they enjoy this, but maybe they enjoy to have the, the last uh, model uh, of the pixel, uh, <laughs> the mobile phone or whatever, yeah. which is in any case, uh, I don't know, maybe pixels. the, the nephew said it. it's uh, the, the, yes, it's uh, of the electronics. Yeah. This is pixel, the electronics there is another thing. So it's a detector. And, uh, but sometimes people, uh, oh, but I, I always think it's a matter that physicists uh, explain uh, to other people and uh, that young people, uh, they are enthusiastic about this, uh, 
they can spread and push in this direction. Yes. So I think we're down to one school. I they do yeah. have okay. uh, one or two more questions. Please. Uh, there's one question about dark matter. Mm -hmm. So can the LHC <laughs> be used to detect dark matter? Do you guys want to say so something? That's, about a, that's that? again. That's again the what I just said. So so far we haven't seen anything that is uh, resembling the dark matter or would explain the dark matter in in the universe that we think that is there. Um, but what if the interaction is very rare? What if we would see it if we would have much more collisions? This is what we can do at a feasible price at this moment. So that's have to do. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can say a word about practically, practically speaking, how could we do this? So the assumption as Sultan is saying is that all we know about dark matter is that it interacts gravitationally. We have no evidence that it interacts in and any other way. Weakly. Maybe what? Right? Maybe weak. But we don't know. Maybe don't yes, know. maybe no. <laughs> so if, if it interacts weakly or maybe even other interactions, then we have a chance of producing it at CERN and at the LHC. Uh, but we don't know until we check, right? And it might be a very rare interaction. So we need more and more data to just exactly. search. So yeah, in principle, we could observe it at CERN if it interacts in some way that we can. So it's impossible to really answer if we're going to see it or not. We have to explore and find out. And this is why some particle physicists, they decided to go to put the detectors in space because in case you cannot produce on the ground, maybe you can study with a particle detector uh, which has the same philosophy as, uh, for example, mm -hmm. CMS, CMS, they have the same uh, design and philosophy, but you put in space and you get particles coming from the space and, and uh, studying other processes, maybe you can answer on the nature, uh, mm -hmm. the nature of the, of the yeah. dark matter. You have mm -hmm. the best accelerator. The yeah, only problem yeah, with it exactly. is that it is very exactly. weak. So. Exactly. <laughs> yes, the problem, I, I, I am used to say that, okay, when you are in space, you don't know the, 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 the ingredients you put in your machine, but you have a very, a lot of energy you can mm -hmm. get. Yeah. While uh, when you are on the ground, you know perfectly what you are putting inside. You can make prediction uh, following your model, but then, okay, the energy is so low with respect to yeah, the cosmic accelerators. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are trying to attack okay. the same problem from different sides. Uh, we need both because yeah, in, exactly. in your case, you, you have practically infinite energy, but at a very low luminosity. Yeah. And also you cannot control from which direction or more or less. Uh, and and, and, and it, is, it, is, it is not so easy to cope with. In our case, we have a more directed, more controlled beam but of course not at so much high energy. So I think we have maybe one last question. Yeah, exactly. That's time that's for that's it, that's but maybe we should- uh... oh, Sorry, we, we were just taken by- Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know, this is the kind of the very nice thing when you start talking to other scientists here at uh, yeah. It's These kind of conversations, I think you're getting a, a very interesting glimpse at we because yeah. some, uh, so wine. this is how the physicists used to <laughs> yes. talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe one last question is about how I, I hope it's kind of a simpler question. Uh, how do we get the magnets to four Kelvin? And I think Sultan. Uh, yes. Likes so this question. Um, during my professional life, I, I had some detours, and one was uh, uh, some um, affair with the with the cryogenics. Uh, uh, of optical fibers, etc. And so far, until then, I thought that it is so complicated to cool down something to 4.2 Kelvin. And uh, that time, my colleague just explained to me she was extremely, extremely uh, good in this topic. And uh, I asked, uh, tell me how you do this. And she said that, oh, it's very simple. We just pour liquid <laughs> nitrogen on. And as long as the nitrogen evaporates, it is not yet on 4.2. And once once uh, everything calms down and there is no bubbles and and uh, uh, boiling in the in the pot, you are at 4.2. Going down to 1.9 is not so easy, <laughs> but, but but the 4.2 is is pretty easy if you have money to buy so much helium and put it on. Yeah, but I think it's a lot of. Uh... 
turbines and uh... making a liquid helium is a completely no, that's that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's another topic. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly, yeah. you can buy it from Linda, for example. Sorry yeah. for the ad. Uh, and and finally, so they 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 try to get the energy out from the from the gas. They try to get it away, and they they use the normal cooling process, what the this expansion process that we the know from the refrigerator. Exactly yeah. at to the end. At the very end, they have turbines, and these turbines, as they as they rotate, they take away the the final energy from the helium. I don't know the details of this. This is really a miracle. I love it. I love the miracles to understand them. And and but but this is as Marky said, uh, you can simply buy this. Yeah, we this we did it as well. This is heavy engineering. I mean, it's a quantity, but as long as you have liquid helium and a good system to pour uh, liquid helium around your magnets you get in the superconductive state of course you have the hell of good following of temperature what's happening because if you move a micro kelvin there it's it's an issue so it's a very controlled process but it is a, a, a elaborate high level good quality engineering it is if you have known tools you are not shooting into the unknown mm -hmm. that yeah. has to this be is, said at mm -hmm. least at this point but there are two very strong questions or things to be solved if you are making a superconductive magnet let's say one is that what you do if it quenches when it then it suddenly yes. sees mm -hmm. and the the other is that that could be understood much much easier but you have the current at room temperature, but you want to take it down to the uh, to the magnet, which is at 4.2. And this transition should be done on a very good conductor, but a very good conductor is a heat conductor as well, usually. So uh, this is one of the one of the major problems that you have to solve: how to to make the current leave. How to inject? The how current. to inject mm -hmm. the current in without injecting mm -hmm. heat in? And, and maybe really quickly, if you're not familiar, Sultan said, talked about a quench. And in superconducting magnets, if you have a sort of a temperature fluctuation, it, this could be mechanical or whatever. Yeah. If you lose superconductivity, even microscopically, that is going to expand because that means you generate a little bit of heat and that expands like a bubble. If you do nothing, your magnet will explode. So you have to you know, get rid of all that current immediately. Yeah, this as we call it a positive feedback. Uh, which is not as positive. So I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, do, yeah, we, do you guys have anything else? Let's just ask for more questions. Yes, more, more questions. questions. <laughs> as a matter of fact, there are a couple more questions. They're a little more esoteric, but um, uh, I'll, well, they wrote them down, so I will ask them for them. The first one, we saw a TED talk from about five years ago about the LHC in which the speaker um, in talking about the standard model put up this huge equation and said this equation answers everything about everything including he said why the sky is blue and the question we got is what does that mean how does an equation do that uh, why the sky is blue is an electromagnetic yeah, interaction is, uh, yeah. so you should look at the interact uh, uh, electromagnetic part of the of this equation and yes. that tells, but the the problem with this is that uh, it would be so easy if we would have this equation only and we could calculate everything, including chemistry, up to the the vaccine of the COVID nineteen. Uh, this this cannot be done. This there was a, there was a view about physics about hundred years ago that this can be done. Now we know that this the information. And the, the, the complexity of the word is, is so huge that, that it, is, it is impossible to deduce anything, uh, let's say, on either on the rainbow or on the, 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 the hue of the sky from this equation. Uh, for that, you have, uh, you have to, to go many levels up. I wouldn't call simplify the models because my colleagues would kill me on the spot. But, <laughs> but, but it's a kind of a kind of a thing that that uh, 
um, it is better to use those equations for for those explanations. But as far as we can say that the world is governed by these huge equations and even even the equations behind them, because we we cannot say anything about gravity here. I'm always keep in mind, uh, but uh, but. This is what 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 would be uh, the same grail to to find one equation for all. But anyway, it is it is this impossible is to deduce anything. Yeah, it's exactly. About the, yeah, the range of applicability. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say something? This equation, this equation. Sorry if I see I, I see the positive because this means that there is a lot of things to do. But this uh, this equation, which is uh, the standard model equation, is yeah. describing only the five percent. <laughs> what is our universe uh, if we did a good exhibition okay. the rest is dark matter and, uh, and dark, dark energy, energy that and we, we don't even know what it is. With, uh, okay dark in, <laughs> yeah. in, uh, in the, the the wider sense you can uh, you can think dark in we don't have a clue so we know a little bit precise let's say a tiny part of our yeah. universe which is the standard model as Sultan say, we, we, we have the basic, we know how we can describe how the bricks interact together, um, but only for the 5% of our, uh, our and, world. Even, and even then less, our cells are, are many layers up. Exactly, even less, because we don't know what, what these equations would look like in, for let's, example, say, let's say, close to a black hole or, or a neutron star. Yeah. Where, all the things are mixed but up. Also quarks, so we don't right. know exactly, so, exactly how to describe sorry, So this them. is another <laughs> another good question to if you want to get physicists uh, discussing between each other. But I would say generally, there's plenty that the center model does not describe. It's very specific at what it does. Yeah. It describes the fundamental interactions between elementary particles. Mm -hmm. And if you try to describe anything else, you're better off using a different model. One, one thing that I've, I don't know, it's, I don't know whose quote this is, but something about if you want to go to the moon, you just or or do anything in space, really, you just need need Newtonian mechanics. You don't need any quantum mechanics. You don't need any relativistic anything. So maybe the relativistic at some point, but but you don't need not the to go to the moon. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's a good question, and I I bet we could talk about it for thirty minutes. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Well, we have one last one. If you we take a couple more minutes, yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah. Which, which is also a little out there. It's nice we can do this before we get back to talking about moment of inertia. So the question is: Are there any potential consequences from your experiment that you're concerned about? And if so, what? You mean you mean the black the hole that will eat <laughs> up the car parking together with my car? <laughs> Is that what we mean? No. <laughs> or that or anything else? Uh, I would say no. no. So so actually, actually, if we are at the, 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 the black holes, it, it would be so nice to create black holes. Did we find anything so far? No, they work on that. <laughs> so uh, um, so actually, it would be so nice to, to create tiny little black holes. These, these would be really micro black holes. That would evaporate uh, in, in a in a, in a fraction of the second, uh, fraction, fraction, fraction of the second. Uh, but we would at least understand that how it creates and how it, it it behaves. These black holes would not eat up neither my car nor the beam pipe uh, or the experiment. Uh, on the other hand, we don't know what we can find uh, if we could. If we could see, well, actually, cranking up the the luminosity will not uh, bring anything such a new thing. No. And that is another, and that is another very important thing. Tonya is here. She is working for the AMS, where they have any orders of magnitude uh, energetic particles coming in. And, and black hole. Yeah, exactly. And she is still working for them. No yeah, the, the interactions that they see are more dangerous than whatever we exactly. could possibly do. Actually, actually, generally speaking, the, the, the reason why we are speaking about now, why this question might arise, is that the, the, the Earth was not destroyed by anything like this during the, the past 4.2 billion years. 
I think this is this is a that's good quite enough a bit of luminosity there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so actually, the the four point two billion years integrates up the up yeah. to the good luminosity. And, and the other thing to say is that all models, no matter how nice and sexy they sound when you read them, when you discuss them, they are just uh, models and assumptions until they are proven mm -hmm. by a measurement with an error bar on it. So this is what you have. There are very oh, many, that? very beautiful, beautiful in terms of theoretical models, in terms of taking all the forces in nature and making one, for example, in terms of whatever model you like, it sounds to our intellect, it sounds nice, correct and clear, but until you measure it, and until you say with what error you've done the measurement, you have nothing. And a theory is a valid theory for physics, for our field to test when through the accelerators we have, or through even going to space, we have the tools for proving or disproving it. But if it is going to discuss mega, super duper gazillion uh, EV of energy that we have no way to detect or to produce, it's a theory and it will remain such until it gets the possibility to be tested. Exactly. So there we are very... Yes, okay. We, no, I can only add that, okay, in, uh, from the theoretical point of view and also experimental point of view, there are recent papers uh, confirming this evaluation, also observed from some uh, uh, from some uh, detection, uh, astrophysical, not mm -hmm. astrophysical, mm -hmm. but astrophysical detection, that uh, it's really is related to the Hawking's radiation, and it, it seems that it's uh, let's say, of course, it's always difficult to 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 detect, but uh, it's been detected, and the calculation confirm that this evaporation. So the fact that Sultan was saying that okay, we can even produce these uh, small black holes, but then they disappear immediately. This is uh, confirmed. It seems so. So maybe I can add a maybe a different approach to the question. The question was about, is there anything you can think of that uh, we can discover or, or observe that would have significant implications? And other so than- We are looking at the well, predictable. Other, right, this other, is well, the well, most- Actually, than, well, actually that, is, that is a very clear thing. Yeah. We want to see beyond the standard model. Yeah. Right. So this is, this is, this is again, another holy grail. We yeah. want to, to, to find, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just <laughs> gonna say like, even if we do, or like another question that, that I've uh, heard people ask is, what can you do with the Higgs? You discovered this new particle, how can we make iPhones with it? And uh, you know, even for new physics, it's not immediate uh, or dark matter. It's not immediate that it will have any application at all because you, we have to build this machine that costs billions of dollars and spend uh, you know decade, like a decade to find it uh, so this is not a particle that we're just going to make a factory and just make them and, and I, at least me, not let in me recall, let me uh, call a, 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 a urban legend about when uh, I think it was uh, Queen Victoria uh, mm -hmm. uh, where, where, where somebody maybe Maxwell uh, showed some 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 electric things you know the uh, the the glass rod with, with papers when you uh, um, do these tricks. And the question was that from, from the queen, that what is it good for? The physicist said that, I don't know, I don't know, but at one day you might take taxes for. And if you think of that, the ancient Greeks played a little bit with these uh, with these tiny little papers and 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 the uh, dust and whatever when when they they uh, did this electric thing actually the word electron comes from Greek uh, yes they, the they didn't the stone. It's, 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 stone. it's amber exactly amber. 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 and they yeah. didn't think about the mobile phones and the computers but we are there so so no one can predict what is the use of these things that we find? This is 
I think this is our obligation as, as scientists to put all these things on the table. And at Science some point- Science needs of time. Yeah, it's exactly. not gonna happen overnight, point, that's my point. Several, several decades or, 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 or uh, centuries after now, somebody might find- Can I add the other usual uh, thing we, are, we say? Uh, the relativity theory. Now we use the correction for our signals, okay? Uh, the GPS, so it's exactly. one typical, but also the, for uh, for satellites, etc. But the general okay, relativity. yes, exactly. The general relativity, but okay, we know. It, okay, we could imagine, but we know for sure that when uh, Einstein thought about the general relativity, he was not thinking to the GPS or something definitely, else. Definitely. Or I don't know, Pierre and Marie Curie, when they studied the, the radioactivity, they were not thinking of radiography or whatever about this so yeah. um i would summarize by saying means, uh, it's exploration yes yep. but and, this is the, the and you exciting don't, aspect of exactly science. and and you don't explore because you want faster iphones right you explore because you're interested in what we might find and what implications that might have it's really really difficult to predict uh but yeah i guess from from what you've seen i think you guys will answer sky is the limit we don't know it could be exactly. star wars or star trek or whatever but that's that's very important you don't know what you will find that was a very very famous experiment uh, uh performed by christopher colombo uh he had a he had an assumption that uh, sailing to the west he will get to india uh, and he found something completely different no, no, but okay, this is the most exciting thing. I, how to say, a researcher means somebody who is searching. If you already know what we have to expect, we are not a researcher anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, I would say that as a, as a researcher, I completely agree with you. We are just exploring and uh, uh, trying to find uh, uh, just because we enjoy the research. As a, a a normal person outside of the research, I think that sometimes uh, we could also think of applications because uh, it's also useful. If you think the application you can have with particle physics in the medical domain to treat cancers or to do the PET scan or, or uh, magnetic resonance, and these are simply application, the particle physics or, or the, let's say all the technologies uh, we are using also in CMS or in our detectors. This uh, makes me proud, even if uh, when I'm studying uh, physics and not thinking about uh, this uh, technology transfer, but this makes me proud that we can save lives mm -hmm. for this. So mm, we should uh, take in account the both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, we talked about this a bit earlier as well. Yeah. So this is one of the things we mentioned. And, yeah. I don't know. Anything hey, well, thank, thank you so much. Um, okay. This has been great. We need to sign off. I'm glad we could get this little private tour at the end of it. Um, okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Our pleasure to be here. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.